Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing this morning? Blessed and walking in victory? Amen. Good. Good to have you here today. It's, um, it's a privilege to fill in for Pastor Josh. For those of you who don't know, I'm Pastor Gordon's son. I pastored here for three and a half years, over 27 or 28 years ago, and uh, um, quite, quite a many years ago. And um, I just wanted to make it very clear that I'm uh, thankful to be able to fill in for Pastor Josh as he's on vacation. He was just a teenager when I was uh, pastoring here, and he's grown and become a strong, mighty man of God and a man of faith, and it's an honor to fill the pulpit this morning to fill in for him. Um, if you would open up, we're going to Hebrews. It's, it's going to be on the, the overhead projector there today. We're going to talk about Hebrews 4, and we're going to talk about Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 is our primary text this morning. We're going to talk about what to do when it comes to our weaknesses. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then we, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is not sympathetic with our weaknesses, but in all, way, in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to share this morning with you about what do we do with our weaknesses. And anybody here this morning have weaknesses in your life? Anybody? Okay. So we're talking to the right group, and, and we're talking to the right group because even pastors have weaknesses, amen? But uh, we all struggle with weaknesses as Christians. The question is not do we have weaknesses. The question is what do we do with our weaknesses? And of course, we all want people to know our strengths and we all want to put our best foot forward. We all want people to see the best side of us, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want people to know our best qualities. But Paul gloried in his weaknesses, not just his strengths. It's in your weaknesses that the grace of God flows, not in your strengths. So it's in the weaknesses that the grace of God flows. Now, there's a difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit encouraging us to change in an area of weakness and condemnation from Satan reminding you of your past sins, trying to tell you that you can't be forgiven for your past sins. So there's a difference between conviction of the Holy Spirit and condemnation which come from Satan. The enemy's strategy has never changed, and he's the master of accusing you, pointing out all your flaws, your weaknesses, your mistakes, your past sins. In fact, he will try to keep reminding you of your past failures and uh, to, to fill you with condemnation to perpetuate the cycle of defeat. His ultimate goal is to get you to run from the presence of God, just like he, Adam and Eve ran from the presence of God, so that you don't feel confident in the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, for your flaws, your weaknesses, your sins, your past mistakes, or your present sins. So Hebrews 4 gives us very clear that God uh, sent Jesus and Jesus was 100% God, 100% human, and he dealt with every single Every single temptation that we could face, he faced. The Bible says that he was, temp that he was tempted in the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And so we understand that Jesus can identify with our weaknesses because he's been tempted and tested in every area that we've had weaknesses, and yet he was without sin. So we understand that what are some of the weaknesses that people deal with? For well, and there might be some weaknesses that you can't help. For instance, I was dyslexic growing up. I was born that way. I can't help that. I can't change that weakness. But there are weaknesses we can improve on as Christians, and we're going to talk about that. There might be spiritual weaknesses of spiritual immaturity or prayerlessness, or spiritual immaturity or weakness or, or a lack of staying in the Word or reading the Bible. Uh, staying, uh, you know, not reading the Bible shouldn't cause you to feel guilty, but it should cause you to be hungry. Amen. <laughs> it should cause you to be hungry. If you're not hungry for the word of God after missing it for a few days, uh, after studying the scripture, you know, you know, God wants you to stay spiritually strong. Physical weaknesses. Some people may have some physical weaknesses that are not their fault or not their 
uh, not their own faults. There's people who've developed cancer or things. That there was not, that it was a physical weakness that's not their fault. And we can pray for victory over even those weaknesses and for healing in those weaknesses. There's mental weaknesses of anxiety, fear, and depression. Emotional weaknesses of lack of balance in our emotions or moral weaknesses. Some people struggle with chronic sexual weaknesses or personality weaknesses or flaws. Or this is a tough one, attitudinal weaknesses of anger or bitterness or unforgiveness or pride. And those are attitudinal weaknesses that people struggle with. We all struggle with weaknesses. We all struggle or have some area where we have to lean extra heavy on the grace of God for our sins. And so Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 makes it very clear in some way, shape, or form that we can trust on his grace and his mercy for the forgiveness of sins. So what do we do with our weaknesses? I want to cover the two two topics this morning. Number one, what do we do with our weaknesses when it pertains to salvation? And number two, what do we do with our weaknesses when it deals with sanctification or us living a sanctified or uncommon or holy life? Let's talk about salvation first. In regards to salvation, we are no longer need to ask ourselves the question, am I acceptable before God? That puts the focus on you and places you under the old covenant law. When it comes to salvation under the new covenant, the correct question, is Christ the acceptable before God? Let me explain. In the Old Testament, a sinner would bring the lamb to the priest. The priest would inspect the lamb for perfection, and then he would take and take the sins of the person, lay his hands on the, on, on the lamb. The lamb would absorb the sins of the person, and the priest would examine that lamb for, to make sure it had no imperfections, and then it would impute the imperfections of the, the, the sins of the sinner upon the lamb. He would place his hands on it and pute the sins of the sinner unto the lamb for the forgiveness of sins. So it was not the sinner who was being inspected for perfection. It was the sacrifice that was being inspected for perfection. So it was the lamb. Now the same is true under the new covenant or under the new covenant, God inspect Jesus for perfection, not the sinner. Let me say that again. God inspected Jesus for perfection, not the sinner. And God found that Jesus was without spot or without blemish, and he was the perfect sacrifice who died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And that is just what we celebrated this last week in Resurrection Sunday, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the perfect Lamb of God who died upon the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want you to notice that both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the sinner was not being inspected for perfection. We're going to talk about maturity in a minute, because, but uh, when it comes to your salvation, you're not being inspected for perfection. It was the sacrifice that was expect, inspected. It was a given that a person, if they were bringing a sacrifice or a bird or a lamb or something as a sacrifice, it's a given that they had sin in their life or sin in their past or mistakes that they made. That's why they're bringing a sacrifice. And that's why we bring, accept Christ as our perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. It's a given by accepting Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that we are sinners and we have flaws, we have imperfections, we have a past, we may even be dealing with current sin. So if you struggle with feelings of not being good enough, we're not good enough to earn salvation. You can take a deep breath and rest. You're not good enough to earn salvation. You are justified by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and considered the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of the blood of Christ. So keep your focus in the right place on Christ as the sacrifice for all sins, for your flaws, for your weaknesses. Christ paid for all of them. You you are not being examined in order to earn salvation. I would encourage you to read through Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. For we are, not saved, we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. But then he goes on in verse 10 to say that we are not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. We're going to talk about that at the second part of the message today. How we're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 1. But verse 10, how do we mature? How do we grow? It's not about perfection, it's about his perfection. And so, 
But when it comes to sanctification, we're going to talk about how to spiritually grow. So when it comes to salvation, our weaknesses are not being examined in order to earn salvation. If you've confessed that you believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the Lord of your life and you received him as Savior and you've believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, you are saved and you are saved by the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. Irregardless of your weaknesses, irregardless of your sins, irregardless of your mistakes, he paid for every single one of them by the blood of Jesus. It's been covered in the blood of Christ. So while we do understand that all Christians, though they are not looking uh, that that uh, God is not looking at our perfection in order to earn salvation. He is looking for us to grow and mature in our faith. And our weaknesses should not run our life. And the more we depend upon the grace of God for our weaknesses, the less power that weakness has over us. Let me take a minute to address this topic. To be holy or to be sanctified as a Christian does not mean we are perfect. It does not mean we don't have weaknesses, but it does mean we are uncommon. Let me say uncommon. Everybody say uncommon for me this morning. Uncommon. It means you're uncommon. You're different than the world. You stand out as different. It simply means that you're set apart. This pulpit is set apart to preach from. A Christian is not set apart to live in the world. And I, I don't mean that we can't be in the world. I mean we're not to live like the world. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. And so a Christian is uncommon. We're set apart. These pews are uh, 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 set apart. They're uncommon. They're set apart to sit in. These piano is set apart to play piano. Our life is set apart that we might have uh, live a life of sanctification after we give our life to Christ and a life of holiness. And not perfection, but direction. It simply means to be uncommon, means to set apart for the purpose of the creator. So while as Christians we struggle with weakness, we're uncommon. While the world is living in fornication, we as Christians choose not to. While the world is living in adultery, we as Christians choose not to. Again, being a Christian does not mean we cease to have flaws or weaknesses or occasional sins. It just means that we are uncommon and not like the world. While they live in darkness, we as Christians choose to live in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And there's something about being a Christian that you're approachable, that you're humble, that people know you're not perfect. But there's also something that people respect when you live an uncommon life that they can look at you and say, wow, that Christian is different. He doesn't live like the world. He doesn't talk like the world. He doesn't act like the world. He doesn't behave like the world. He's set apart, and he's different. He's uncommon. So there's something that the world and other Christians can respect about us when we are uncommon. And so while we as Christians, you and I, are not sinless, I hope that as you are growing in your spiritual walk, you do sin less than you used to. Amen. Amen. So while you're not sinless, I hope you do sin less than you used to. Amen. If Jesus came into your life, saved you, sanctified you, filled you with his Holy Spirit, and you're not living different, okay, something's wrong. You're not submitting to the Holy Spirit. You're not staying in the word. You're not in prayer. You're not doing what God has called you to do. So we need to get to the point where we understand that our salvation is not contingent upon our, our perfection, but God does want us to live a sanctified life, a holy life. And even in areas of communication, that we could be better communicators by the grace of God. Now, some people uh, say that they don't want to talk about their weaknesses, but I, I, I want to encourage you this morning that weakness does not have to become wickedness. Weakness does not have to become wickedness. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But weakness does not have to become wickedness. We all struggle with weaknesses, but those weaknesses do not have to become wicked. Some people say, I don't want to talk about my weaknesses, but I understand we don't want our enemy to know all of our weaknesses because sometimes the enemy uses our weaknesses against us. But be bold to share your weaknesses with the Lord because he can strengthen your weaknesses and give you mercy where you are weak. That's what the Bible says. Approach his throne with boldness and confidence in time of need that you might obtain mercy and grace. So, you know, it's interesting, David in the Psalms, 
um, talked to the Lord about almost everything. If you read the whole Psalms, he talked about praise. He talked about worship. He talked about anxiety. He talked about his fears. He talked about depression, his depression. Yeah, David dealt with depression. Is he saying Bible character dealt with depression? Yeah, he dealt with depression. He, pray, he wrote in the Psalms about his enemies. Although those who were trying, he wrote about those who were trying to kill him. David talked to the Lord about everything except for one thing, his weakness for women. And then he fell into a relationship with a married woman named Bathsheba. The only area that David didn't talk to the Lord about was the area that he fell in. And so that's what the area that he fell in and was sin. David was watching Bathsheba bathe probably for months, but his weakness became wickedness when he committed adultery with her. Remember this principle. Weakness does not have to become wickedness. Just because you struggle with weakness does not mean that the Lord can't strengthen your weaknesses and keep you from moving to a place of wickedness where you are out of self-control. Approach his throne with boldness to find grace and mercy and strength for where you are weak. Grace and mercy always flows to the area that you are weakness and, when, and will make you strong in that area. And I think that in some way, shape, or form, you know, had David talked to the Lord about the, the weaknesses, uh, his weakness that he was dealing with, with Bathsheba before the affair, he would have saved himself the headache of having the affair with her. So I used to be, uh, I used to travel and be a motivational speaker uh, and as well as a pastor. But I had this flawed belief that we could somehow just try a little harder and that somehow we could improve upon the old self and somehow by our own strength we could pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and just keep ourselves from our weaknesses. But I've come to a better understanding and I want you to hear the difference between this. A different understanding that a sanctified life, a mature life, a life of fruitfulness is because of a right relationship with the Lord, right relationship with others, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. So when we're in right relationship with God and we're in right relationship with others and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can overcome our weaknesses. And I, and I mean we can be strong where we are weak. As a tree grows from the water, and the nutrients from the ground so a Christian grows and flourishes and matures the right nutrients of staying in the word, staying in right relationship with Christ and walking in the spirit will empower you to help you to live above your weaknesses. Amen. You know, I've come to this understanding that I don't need to improve on my old self. My old self needed to die when I gave my life to Christ. <laughs> Behold, we are old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Hence, when we give our life to Christ, he transforms us. Now, sanctification is a process. It takes time. We don't give our life to Christ and become mature overnight. It takes a process. So sanctification, it's when we get in trouble, when we get in trouble with God and others is when, in some way, shape, or form, we're not understanding that people have weaknesses or or. or, or in some way, shape, or form, we're not understanding with other people's weaknesses. That doesn't mean we have to uh, 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 capitulate to their weaknesses, but that we can be strengthened in our weaknesses when we trust the Holy Spirit and his, and his ways and his word over our life. It's not that we're sinless as Christians, though the power of the Holy Spirit in right relationship, we sin less than we used to. Now, I think it's interesting, and I just just for a brief moment to talk about this. People say, well, you know, did people in the Bible deal with weaknesses? Absolutely. That's what the whole Bible is about. If you read Romans 1 and or Romans 7, the whole chapter of Paul talking about his weaknesses and his struggle with sin. He dedicated an entire chapter to it and then said, you know... <laughs> In verse, uh, in verse 8, verse 1, in the next chapter, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And so when we walk in the Spirit, we can walk above our weaknesses. And Paul walked above some of his weaknesses, even though he struggled with sin, even though he struggled with weaknesses. We do not need the grace of God for the areas that we are strong. We need the grace of God for the areas that we are weak. 
Amen? I make no promise of perfection in my life. The only promise that I make is that I'm not perfect. However, that's what grace is. It's uncommon favor. It's forgiveness for our weaknesses. It's not deserved. It's not earned. It's grace. It's mercy. And God, even, through, even though we struggle with weaknesses, he shows us his unmerited love and compassion and mercy where we are weak and strengthens us in our weaknesses. Yes, even as a pastor, I struggle with weaknesses. We all do. There are many different places people struggle with weakness, spiritual weakness, physical weakness, mental weakness, emotional weakness, moral weaknesses, personal weaknesses, attitudinal weaknesses. We all struggle with weaknesses. We all, in some way, shape, or form, have at least a weakness in one area in our life that keeps us humble. Anybody humbled by your weakness? <laughs> Anybody humbled by your weakness? <laughs> Does it keep you humble? My weaknesses keep me humble. Because <laughs> when I get to doing this and starting to point the finger at everybody else, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I got three pointing back at me. Because my weaknesses are just as glaring as some other people's weaknesses. So all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and need grace and mercy. So when dealing with one another, let the love flow. Let the love flow. Let the mercy flow. Let the grace flow. Let the power of, of Christ and his love, you know, that one of my dad's favorite scriptures is, they shall, uh, how will you know that they are disciples? By their love one for another. That's how you'll know that they're disciples, by their love one for another. So you can look at somebody who's struggling with some weaknesses in their area, and you could say, come on, brother, come on, sister, let's pull you up and let's help you. That's what a shepherd did. He had a shepherd's staff, and when a sheep would start to get off to the left or to the right, he would just take and tap the sheep. And then he would start to go over here and tap the sheep a little bit, and then tap the sheep, and he'd get the sheep back on the right path because he knew if a sheep got off by himself, he was vulnerable to a wolf or to attack of the enemy. And so we understand in some way, shape, or form that it's a shepherd's job to keep us on the straight and on the narrow. It's the Holy Spirit's job, but it's a, special, it's a pastor's job to nudge the sheep when they start to wander off, off of path. Just to nudge them. We don't beat the sheep, we feed the sheep, and we direct and lead and guide the sheep. You see the difference? And so we understand that. We all struggle with weaknesses. We all have some weakness in our Life where we have to rely extra heavy on the grace of God. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. He didn't say, because of the grace of God flows in my life to my weaknesses, uh, not, ju not just to my strength, but to my weaknesses. Paul, the apostle, knew he had weaknesses, and he must lean upon the grace of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord for his weaknesses. Now, I'm not saying move to the lowest cannot. Can uh, lowest uh, common denominator and live an immoral life. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life of sanctification, of maturity after we give our life to Christ. And though we're not being inspected for our uh, perfection in order to earn our salvation, we are in some way, shape, or form being encouraged to grow in the right direction. And we all have a leaning side. I have a leaning side. I don't mean a physical leaning side. I mean a spiritual leaning side. I don't mean a physical leaning side, I mean a spiritual leaning side. Even as pastor, I have to lean extra heavy, as a pastor, I have to lean extra heavy on the grace and the mercy of God, and so should we. Being a Christian doesn't exempt us from having weaknesses or flaws. Being a Christian means we rely extra heavy on the grace for where we are weak, and we do struggle with weaknesses. So, I want to bring this to a close today. You know, I used to look at people's strengths and think, wow, you're really strong in that area. I really, you know, I, I'm impressed by that area. You're really strong. But I, what I'm thinking that I've learned, people say, well, how long did it take you to prepare this message? 27 years? 26 years? 26 years? Amen? Some of you could, you know, if you were to tell your testimony, people would say, when did you learn all, when did you get, the, oh, in the last 20, 20 years? <laughs> The Lord's grown and matured and helped us to grow and mature. Believe me, there was a time I was the prodigal son and my dad was praying for me um, and I was backslidden for a short time. So I understand what it is to have weaknesses and I understand what it is to be humbled by the fact that we all have weaknesses and rededicated my life to Christ. Now the Bible tells us in 
1 Peter um, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So whenever we want to depend upon our own strength, our own effort, or our own wisdom, he will allow us to do so, but when we trust him for our weaknesses where we are weak and we ask him to help us, him, help us overcome those weaknesses and to be our strength in the areas where we're weak, we're shining light on those when we talk to the Lord and it disperses the darkness of weakness over our life and we become strong in those areas, strong in those areas, amen. And so that's how you know, we dispel the darkness of Satan in our life and we bring the light of the gospel into our situation and allow the Holy Spirit to flow to our weaknesses. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, amen, amen. So I'm trusting, you know, there might be people who say that uh, they're stronger than me, and uh, you may be right. I'm dyslexic. I, I have, you know, weaknesses in my life. I'm not perfect, but I'm not trusting God in my own strength. I'm trusting his Holy Spirit to help me in my area of weaknesses to become stronger. So like a David, we don't have failures. Amen. We can walk in victory in the areas over our weakness. And so we understand that. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble or unmerited favor to the humble. If you'll just humbly say to the Lord, Lord, I have weaknesses. Let your Holy Spirit flow in those areas where you're weak. You know, if somebody gets a cut on their arm and they start to bleed, you apply where, where the wound is. You know, the weakest area gets the most attention. And so when we're Christians, you give yourself, the, the, the weakness gets the most attention. And, and the Bible says that we should consider each other, that, that uh, we, you know, no one in the body of Christ is more important than each other, that we should consider even the least members. You know, if, if, the, if the least of the person in the church falls, or, uh, then we should strengthen them and uphold them in the Christian faith. So the, I want to just close by saying this, and I think that this is kind of something that took me many years to really realize but the sooner that you realize that the Bible is all about men and women who had weaknesses, who trusted in God in spite of their weaknesses, the better off we'll be. I mean, you look at the Hebrews Hall of Faith, it looks like more like a who's who in the Enquirer. And I'm not saying it's okay that these people did these things, but it looks like a who's who in the Enquirer. I mean, it's like, like you looked up and you know, just, uh, you know, looked up like some of these people, these men and these women in the Bible were radical characters and had great mistakes in their life. But the great things they accomplished through faith, they made it into the Hebrews Hall of Faith. You think with your weaknesses, you could make it into the Hebrews Hall of Faith? You betcha. You betcha. Amen. Amen. I believe you can make it into the Hebrews Hall of Faith. And, uh, and I believe that Hebrews Hall of Faith may, is still continuing today. I think the scripture talks about that we're living epistles, that our life story is being written, that you know, even though the Bible is done with, that the Christians' lives are still being written and that we're living epistles. So these were seriously flawed human beings who in spite of their weaknesses found faith in their creator and accomplished amazing things in spite of their weakness. So if you have weaknesses like me, or like the men and the women in the Bible, we have to lean extra heavy on the grace of God. I've got a places that I lean extra heavy on my dad and on other leaders in the church. I got, I got areas in my life that I lean extra heavy on the grace of God. I got areas in my life that I lean extra heavy on the Holy Spirit because he strengthens those weaknesses that we can become strong.